Welcome to Theology Unplugged. I'm Michael Patton. This is number 21 of our Through Theology in a Year. And as you, I tell you every time, we're getting through all of theology from the very beginning to the very end in one year. Thank you all for coming. Uh, please, if you can, uh, I would love to have you as one of my patrons. That is how I support myself. And maybe there'll be a patron symbol that comes up right here. I don't know if I can if I can coordinate that, but otherwise you go to patron.com forward slash C Michael Patton. If you enjoy what's going on here, that's the best way to support us. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. We are continuing through our study of uh, through theology in a year, and right now we are on this. We have been on this for a while, and we're going to stay on this for a little while. We're getting close. I mean, we're winding it down. I'm not going to spend all my time. This is not a course on how to interpret the Bible. I'm just trying to display how important it is for us to have a good methodology in deriving our theology from the scripture. How do we go from the text, an ancient text, to a timeless principle that creates uh, the beliefs that we hold to, that we hold to dearly, that we that we believe in with all of our heart, that we commit our entire lives to? Uh how do we do that responsibly? I mean, is, is there a way? And I'm saying, absolutely. There is a way there is a process and I'm showing you this process. And this is the process we're going to use throughout the entirety of the theology program. Now it's much more extensive because I'll keep on building on it as we get further down the line. Whenever we talk about other sources of theology besides just the scripture, whenever we talk about uh, reason and when we talk about experience and when we talk about emotions, how all those contribute to our theology, which they do. Okay, but right now we are talking about this chart and I'm walking you through it. Now, what my goal is, is to walk you through it in a few different ways. This time it's going to be a little bit more detailed than we've had before. We're going to be going through it in, in a way where um, uh, each one of the commandments and each time, each time I present this, I'm just going to try to dig a little bit deeper, try to dig the hole that you guys see, the excavation, if you will, a little bit more thorough, not complete, not showing you every aspect of it, but just showing you how you build on this slowly. We're going through the Ten Commandments. We're going to go through them a few, I mean, I don't know how many we're going to go through. We may get through, you know, it may be today that I decide we're finished. I don't think so. I think we'll probably go through one or two more and then I might do something else just to show it. So maybe two or three more po podcasts with this process, but I want you to see the importance of it. The third commandment. So let's talk about the third commandment. Let's uh, move over to this. Remember, we are looking at it this way. We are trying to go from the author's intent. No, notice here. Let me explain this once again. You've got the line that separates the top from the bottom. Time bound audience under the line, time less audience above the line. Now I understand there's no such thing as a timeless audience in, in in the sense that there is a time bound audience, but it's just trying to help you to understand that whenever we look at it below the arc, on the left hand side, we're looking at the ancient audience. We're looking at how did they how did they understand what it is we're talking about back in their day? Then we're asking, how do we eternally understand it? How does it have application for all time, all people, all places? Uh, and that is the timeless audience. And then once we decide that it does have application for all time, all places, then we decide how to, uh, we, we contextualize it, we reclothe it and say, how does that apply to us today? Now, there's a lot of tricky areas. And maybe I'll talk a little bit more about this in a couple podcasts down the road, where the clothing that you wear in the ancient audience is the exact same clothing you wear in the contemporary audience. Like with the sacraments, that's a very interesting case study in this. And, and maybe we'll look at it that way. I don't know. Like I said, I don't want to spend too much time on this. I just want to feel satisfied that we've gotten through it well. We're going through the third commandment, and the third commandment is this at least for the Protestant, right? Uh, you shall not take the, Lord, the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. 
So, what does that mean? Well, if we were to, if I was to ask you, hey, or, or the average Joe out on the street, if I was to say, what does that mean to take the Lord's, have you taken the Lord's name in vain today? What do you think they would immediately think of, uh, at least in our culture? I mean, you know what I'm talking about. It's, it is coming down to this, okay? If we started in our culture today, notice here on the bottom right-hand quadrant, you got the guy, and he accidentally said a curse word. So whenever you're talking about do not take the Lord your God's name in vain, we usually think of it, yeah, I, I haven't cursed, and I especially haven't cursed with the Lord's name. Now, there's all kinds of problems with this, not only with our understanding of what a curse is compared to what a curse is back then, but the idea of a name. We have no concept hardly at all of what a name means. Now, no, I'm not saying not at all. I'm not saying that at all because there's a lot lot of people out there who really take concern in naming their children, and this may be as close to it as we get. But they say, listen, I want to name him after somebody, like I did with my uh, sons. I named him, I named him biblical names or some name that had to do with something in history. I named one of my sons after William Wallace. That was Braveheart. You know, I loved him. And I thought, you know, this is a, this is a great legacy. Um, I'm not saying I named him after the actual character. I named him more after the movie than anything else. So he's been named after Mel Gibson. But uh, with uh, my other son, Zach, a biblical character. So it was kind of like I wanted to have some deeper meaning. Now, my wife named the girls, and she has a different concept of this. And so whenever we had Caitlin and Kylie, she wanted all K's. Now, she wanted to take the K's, the alliteration, into the boys as well. But I said, got to stop this. I want, I want, to, I don't want all K's. So we compromised. I named the boys, she named the girls. But some, sometimes we have a concept of what it means to name someone, and sometimes we don't. But even when we do, it is barely a concept compared to when we go into the original author's uh, audio, or when we go to the that their their uh, culture and their understanding of what these terms mean, what they heard whenever they heard the third commandment, you shall not take the Lord your God's name in vain. There is all kinds of questions that we have to ask. Now, we ask first, of course, what did it mean then? Not what does it mean today, but what did it mean then? And when we ask this question of what did it mean then, and put this in the context of the author's intent, what did the author say, what did the original audience hear, we have all of these different different questions that we have to ask, all of these different fields of study that we have to get into, the historical interpretation, the grammatical interpretation, the contextual interpretation, and the literary interpretation, all of these have to do with how we understand what it, what the author's intent was. Now, with this particular one, what I've done is I said, let's interrogate the text a little bit. That's my new little graphic right there. If you can see that, an interrogation symbol. We're going we're gonna to ask the right questions of the text and try to get through this. Now, here's the questions that I would say we have of this particular text whenever it says, do not take the Lord your God's name in vain. Uh, what is meant by name? That's the first question. What, what do they mean by name? I was just going through and telling you that we have something we mean by name. What did they mean whenever they heard the Lord your God's name? Also, what does it mean to take? You see, to take, that's a, that's a weird verb. Uh, to take the Lord your God's name, don't take my name. I've never asked anybody not to take my name somewhere. Now, I have asked my wife to take my name. That is as close as we can get as well to taking something, take, taking somebody's name. Whenever I ask Christine to marry me, and we still do this, most, in the Western culture at least, I'm sure it's done around the world. It hasn't been completely drowned out. But whenever you get married, you take the name of your husband. What does it mean to take that name, that family name? You become part of his family. You become identified no longer with your previous family. As you know, the Bible says, whenever it says, she, uh, for a man shall leave his father and his mother and be cl- and cleave to his wife, 
wife. There's a new family that is created. It is one family, and that family has a name. And so my wife is named Christy Patton. All my children are named Pattons until my two daughters. One of them is already married, so she is not a Patton anymore in the same sense. She has taken somebody else's name. But Christy now is identified as a Patton. And whenever she goes places, she used to be a Newcomb. Whenever she goes places, she is no longer identified with the Newcomb family primarily. She is identified with the Patton family. She is a representative of that family. So what does it mean to take a name? We have some concept of it, but not really a whole lot of concept of it. Okay, then what does it mean to do so in vain? See, we've got all kinds of bridges that we have to cross here in order to understand how it is that we that we understand this passage, and most of them have to do with terminology. And the last question is, how, how, what does it mean to do so in vain? What do we mean when we're taking a name in vain? Now, again, normally we think of cursing. We go back to to today, uh, the normal person on the street, and that's what we think, uh, is how have we used God's name? How have we misused it, but we don't know what they're talking about in that day, and it's much different. There is a bridge to cross, and I want to try to help you cross that just so you can understand how this process works and how we get our timeless principle, how we derive our theology from passages such as this. Okay, so here's here, here's some of the things I want to look at. Uh, what ways did nations take the name of their gods? I like that because here's what I'm doing is I'm trying to understand in the culture of Israel and how did how did uh, the other nations, you know, they're coming for, remember last time we talked about they're coming out of the land of Egypt, they're going into the land of Canaan. What was the worldwide culture? What was the culture of the Middle East? Did they take the names of their gods? Because here's God coming on the scene, Yahweh saying, listen, we're doing things differently. You know, my name, you're going to take it, but you're not going to take it in vain. Well, how did everybody else take the names of their gods? And that's it. I'm not asking how did they take the names of their gods in vain, because that's irrelevant right now, because we don't know about that. God's not speaking about that. He's just saying, whenever you take my name, you don't do so in vain. So we asked the question, how did they take the names of their gods in that day? And here's a few different ways. Number one, in prophetic representation. Whenever they blessed and whenever they cursed people, they would do so using the name of their God. What is it they're doing? They're using the reputation of that God. Very much like Christie carries the reputation of the Patton family now. We care, they, God's saying, I want you to take my name and I want you to represent me to the world. So, how do you do that? The, the other nations would do it in prof, uh, prophetic representation. They would bless people. They would curse people. They'd say, in the name of Baal, you are going to win this war. Or in the name of Marduk, I tell you that the next 10 years will be full of abundance. That kind of stuff. That would be taking the name of their God. They are representing that God before whatever audience, whether it's a king or whether it's a commoner, you are representing that God whenever you make a prophecy. Whenever you say, God has said, then you are taking the name of your God. You see, you're taking his reputation. And in a very real way, this is important for those of us who teach, and it keeps me in constant fear because here I am in the middle of what we are doing right now, and I am taking God's name. What am I doing? I'm interpreting. I'm telling you what I believe this means. And I'm doing so with some degree of authority because I'm convicted of this. Therefore, I am taking it even more strongly. And I'm trying to tell you right now that to take God's name means this. Therefore, I'm taking God's name. You see what I'm saying? Okay, so... What, what other ways did they do it? What other ways did they do it in that day? Well, in oath-taking and in contracts, whenever they would sign contracts, whenever they would make oaths to people, they would do so in the name of their God. Pulling in the reputation of their God, and all of that that means, because again, name is reputation, pulling in that reputation and saying, I swear by the name of of uh, whatever God, Ra, the sun God, Ra, that uh, I will do this. 
well, what are you doing at that point? You're not saying Raw is going to do it. You're saying I'm going to do it. But at the same time, it's basically the same thing because you're taking the reputation of that God. What other ways did they do? Well, in uh, national identity and behavior, whenever you whenever you go out and you act under a name, Christy goes out and acts as a patent. Uh, we we take on certain names, certain reputations. In this case, we're taking on God's reputation. Now, what if we go out there and we say, "I'm a Christian," and uh, you know, I want everybody to know that beforehand, I am a Christian. Therefore, whatever I do is representative of the Christian God. And so we take God's name everywhere. We're taking His reputation everywhere. So, I mean, it, it, there's just so many ways in which we take his name, right? And we've, we've really covered kind of at this point, what does it mean to be a name of a God? What, is, what does the name mean? The reputation. And what does it mean to take? So we've got those two down, right? I think so. I think I'm doing well. I think, what did it mean then? I am covered. I've studied this enough. I've gotten enough background in it. I think that I can tell you with confidence, go out and study it yourself. This is what you're going to find. You're not going to find that it's saying a curse word, certainly, but you probably won't even find it saying GD because that's, that's often the way we think. I mean, is, isn't it funny the way we think about this? We think... Well, here's the first two commandments. Don't have any other gods. Don't create any idols. We kind of get that now. But why? I mean, here's God all of a sudden kind of coming in with this petty thing. Oh, yeah, there's this one phrase that I don't want you to say ever, and it's uh, and it's GD. You know, it's, you know what I'm saying here, right? <laughs> and so it's, it's you don't say, you don't call upon me, God, to damn something. That's the way I can put it. You don't call upon God to damn something, and so whenever you say it, maybe maybe you just don't say it generically. You know, you you actually have to do it in a in an intentional way. I call on God to damn you. Then it wouldn't be so bad, right? But whenever you just put those two words together, God doesn't like it. It irritates him. He's like, man, I'm going to put that as the third commandment because that's really really important to me. It doesn't make any sense, and it doesn't matter. Listen, listen, listen. In our theology. It doesn't matter whether it makes sense sometimes, and we got to get over this. The palatability of a doctrine does not determine its veracity, meaning how well it tastes, how well you get it, doesn't always mean that's how true it is. But a lot of times it does. We're created in the image of God, and he wants us to understand these things. And whenever it comes to the Ten Commandments, I think we can understand this, and I don't think it has anything, maybe a tiny bit, depending upon the person and how you say it, it has to do with saying GD, okay? Uh, calling on God to damn something uh, without saying it that way, saying just a phrase. So I do not see this as God saying something. I mean, I just don't see him as being that petty, saying uh, that's all I care about. Like I said, it could be. You study it yourself. You come to your own conclusions about this because it's that important. But, uh, and I'm not saying saying GD or any curse words is okay in the Christian world. I don't think it's necessarily bad. I mean, it just depends on the context. I don't cuss. I've ne- I mean, my parents didn't really around me. I just have grown up not doing it. Whenever somebody else does around me, even whenever they say GD, unless they are saying it in such a way that they're trying to offend me because they know I'm a Christian, they're like, watch what I'm going to do. But that's not because they're taking the third commandment and breaking it at its worst level. It's just because they're trying to offend me, and it's just kind of irritating sometimes. But that's it. Okay, so that's that's where it goes. You may be different. You may have grown up, and you say, I cannot hear that word. That's fine. But just just understand why you can't. It doesn't. I do not believe it has to do with breaking this commandment in a severe way in any sense. Maybe just the smallest way, but not a severe way. But here's what I'm saying by that. Isn't that funny? That the third commandment, one, two, three, I mean, there's only 10. And one of the 10, 10% of these 10 things God tells us to do that are kind of the overarching of all the law, the umbrella of all the law, we take and we narrow it down so in such a petty way, if I'm correct. And it has so much more meaning than that. It has so much deep meaning. When God says to us, don't take his name in vain, if we're walking through this correctly, we are saying it has 
something to do with us taking, I mean, we, we carry around the signet ring of God. So I've got this little thing with the signet ring. I had AI draw that out. So, but that's the signet ring right there. We're carrying it around and anything we write down, anything we say in the context of who we are as Christians, anything we say on behalf of God, we are stamping it down with that signet ring and we're saying it's approved. And that's what a signet ring means. We are, we are walking around with the signet rings of God and he says, hey, listen, be darn careful with that signet ring. I'm giving this to you, but be careful. That makes sense, doesn't it? It makes a little bit more sense, at least right now. Let's keep on going. Let's, let's look at it from the perspective of well, well here, here's the next level. Here's the next level. I'm te- I, I hinted at this last time, but let's do this this time. Let's create an exegetical statement because that's what we want to do. If you're studying this, if you're preaching this, this is a great way to go about it. Once you've studied it in the context, you want to create what is called an exegetical statement. Exegesis means to bleed out, to bring out. Uh, You don't need to know that big word, but exegetical statement means what is the statement that you have come to from bringing out what the scriptures originally meant? And this is what I would say. Yahweh commands Israel not to misuse his name by burying it. See see the words I'm using? I'm not saying taking anymore. I'm using bearing because we need to switch wording around whenever we're creating an exegetical statement. Otherwise, we're just restating what is already there and maybe built within our traditions. Restated a different way. Restated a different way. Over and over again, restate it. That is the best way to understand something is seeing how, how well you can restate it. That's why in arguments with your wife, counselors will tell you, All right, whenever you're listening to her, restate what she just said in different words so that she can know you understand her. Well, restate it here. Yahweh commands Israel not to misuse his name by burying it in ways that are, and here we go, now we're getting into the vain. What does it mean to be vain? Deceitful, disrespectful, unfaithful, thereby misrepresenting in vain, That's the vanity, misrepresentation, his character and authority. So to take his name means you are bearing his reputation. To do it so in vain means to misrepresent his reputation. To to be, uh, to, to carry God and his words around as if they're flippant. No, they don't matter. His reputation, no big deal. You know, carry around, become a Christian and act, whatever. No, God says, hey, be careful. You got my signet ring. Okay, so now we go to the analogy of Scripture, and we test this, and we try to figure out, are there any other... Let me me do this real quick. I'm not going to spend too much time on the analogy of Scripture. We keep on digging deeper, but I want to go one step deeper in what it means to compare Scripture with Scripture, that Scripture interprets Scripture. If we're right about this exegetical statement, God doesn't want us to bear his reputation and misrepresent him, we probably ought to find it in other places in the Bible. So let's go and let's say, well, are there other passages that teach about this same thing? That's how we do analogy of scripture. Are there other passages? Are there other patterns that follow the same pattern? Are there other parallels? Are there other perspectives that look at it a different way, but the same thing? Does it fit into the plot of the scripture that God would want his reputation to protected? Are there prophecies that this passage either uh, uh, makes or fulfills? And what is the place? What is the historical contextual place of similar passages? So those are, that's a kind of a way to look at it, but that is a way to dig deeper into the analogy of scripture. And so when we're asking that, here's where I'd go. I'd say Deuteronomy chapter 18. Here's what I'd say, first of all, absolutely, of course, of course, God wants his reputation protected. Okay, I mean, I would say, absolutely, there is no, there, there is no way he doesn't. Let's ch- try to see if the that is represented in these multiple ways in the rest of the Bible. And in Deuteronomy chapter eighteen, check this out: a prophet. What is a prophet? A prophet is not something who sees somebody who sees into the future. Okay, that that's prophecy we sometimes think of today. But a prophet is simply this. Sometimes he sees into the future because God gives him a vision of the future or a dream of the future or something like that. But a prophet is simply this, 
someone who speaks on behalf of God. Therefore, you can't bear his name more honorably or more dangerously than to say, come up to somebody and say, God has told me to tell you, thus says the Lord. That is the most dangerous ground you can be on, most exciting, most privileged, most, and it's the greatest too, because what if God, if God does, you know, make you a prophet or something like that. But man, I'll tell you what, be careful. It's a scary thing. God still cares about his reputation. Look, re, look at this in Deuteronomy chapter 18. When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if that thing does not come about or come true, that thing that the Lord has not, sp- that is the thing that the Lord has not spoken, that prophet has spoken it presumptuously. In other words, in vain. It's not his. Uh, what's another passage? Uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 13, is speaking about prophets again. If a prophet or dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or wonder, this is even if they do some some miraculous sign to prove they are they have access to God, they have access to his power, then, and the sign or wonder comes true concerning which he spoke to you, the prophet spoke to you, saying, let us go after other gods whom you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord is testing you to find out if you love him and with all your heart and with all your soul. In other words, he's giving you on purpose a representation of his name in vain. He's he's sending you a prophet and allowing that prophet to do things just to test you, just to say something wrong about him. Uh, what's another passage that talks about uh, God lo- wanting to protect his word? Notice here, thus says Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 16 and 17, thus says the Lord of hosts, do not listen to the words of the prophets who are prophesying to you. They are leading you into futility. They speak a vision of their own imagination, not from the mouth of the Lord. They keep saying to those who despise me, the Lord has said, you will have peace. And as for everyone who walks in the stubbornness of his own heart, they say calamity will not come upon you. Now, I have found this characteristic of people using God's name in vain. They'll come and they always have good news. Prophet, I mean, and they'll, uh, there's example after example. I can't uh, get into any more because there's, so, there's just so many examples you could go through uh, in the Old Testament and in the New showing God wants his word protected. But usually whenever people come to you and they're a false prophet, they're usually not going to say anything bad. They're going to say all good news. Oh, the Lord wants me to tell you that tomorrow's going to be a really good day. Or the Lord wants me to tell you that uh, he's here with you and he loves you and he sees your pain. Maybe he does. I'm not saying he doesn't. I'm just saying in these cases, pro- false prophets, fa- people who take God's name in vain in the worst of ways, usually are not trying to be mean. They're not trying to bring up. Th- they may think they have a, something from the Lord. But it's something you got to, you, it's sacred ground. You got to walk on carefully. And here's all I got to say is if you seek to be a preacher, if you seek to be a teacher, if you seek to understand and study God's word, whenever you go out into the world and represent God, do so with trepidation. And I'm not saying you have to be scared about it because we can be careful enough. We can, it's, it's not hard to honor God's name, but we've got to be mindful of it. We've got to be mindful that well, if I was to say to you, the Lord has told me to tell you, and I'm not really sure the Lord has told me to tell you this, and I don't know have any way to prove it, just don't say it. Okay? It's it's you don't know. It's it's too it's too fearful of ground to be on. Okay, that's enough of that. Uh, I had some more passages, but we, we, we've covered it. Okay, what does it mean then? That's the question we are asking in this next quadrant. We're getting close to the end here of this particular session. So we ask, what does it mean? And then in order to find out what does it mean, the best thing to do is not to create an exegetical statement. We've already done that. Let's create a theological statement that is timeless. So we take what we learned just a moment ago, we take that We've already proved it. We've said, yeah, th- this is this is actually taught in other parts of Scripture. So we take that and we turn it into a timeless principle. What does the timeless principle look like? Well, here's what I've got. God commands all people to honor His. Oh, I, didn't, I shouldn't have put His name. That was that was really dumb. What a what a 
what a bad uh, way to represent this teaching. Uh, God commands all people to honor his reputation and character, ensuing that their words and actions faithfully, faithfully represent his holiness and truth. I guess that works because I basically defined name afterwards. Okay, so that, that's a good one. God commands all people to honor his name and character, ensuing that their words, uh, ensuring that their words and actions faithfully represent his holiness and truth. Good way to put it. Okay, so now we say the next step is how does it apply to us? And in this, if we were following the same pattern, which I've been teaching you at least today, digging one step deeper, um, we would create a homiletical statement. A homily is just like a delivery, a sermon. Whenever you hear a homily, some of you go to churches where they give homilies instead of sermons. Same thing. So what is the homiletical statement? Well, that means what? how does it relate to us today? How did it relate to them back then? How does it relate to people of all time? And the homiletical statement is how does it relate to us today? And here's what I've got for the homiletical statement. As followers of God, we must speak and act in ways, notice we, as we, this is us now, as followers of God, we must speak and act in ways that honor and reflect his true nature. Avoiding any misuse of his name that could lead others astray or misrepresent his character. And so I don't see this as being, if anything, it, it, I see this as being massive distraction, saying cursing is taking God's name, even saying GD. I see this as a massive distraction to the true meaning of this text because it is so incredibly deep. There is so much to it. Matthew chapter 23, verse 24 says, you blind guides, you strain out a gnat and you swallow a camel. And in that passage, what he's basically saying is, listen, um, maybe, maybe there is, maybe it is. I mean, let's, maybe curse, maybe saying GD is uh, a, a breaking of this commandment to the slightest degree. I don't know. But if it is, we don't want to, we don't want to strain out gnats and swallow camels. We may be this whole time, our whole life saying, well, I've never broken the third commandment and saying GD, but we're swallowing camels all day long because we're walking out into the world representing God. We're telling people that God told you something or you, we're, even, we're even going and saying this is what the Bible means without fearfulness, without trembling. We're teaching it. You know, we're just saying this is this is what it means. You know, and we speak with such a degree of assurance. I see people out there, even in theology, even people that are well educated. I'm like, I know you can't speak with that degree of assurance on this particular doctrine or something. You need to back off because you 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 can be taking God's name in vain and being so assured of something and. In that assurance, you, you, you have no right to it. You have no right to be that assured. And that overstatement is itself taking God's name in vain, his reputation, how he's revealed himself. Okay, so I hope I hope this is you've seen this. I hope you're we're walking through this well. I pray that this particular passage here has been I don't know, you, you have some enlightenment to it. And and here's the deal. Research it yourself. I mean, only to the degree that I'm right on my exegetical statement will be the degree to which I'm right on my homiletical statement. If I messed up in the exegesis, then probably everything else is going to mess up as well. So we spend the majority of our time in that exegesis. What did it mean then? What does it mean to the author? What did the author mean? What, what is the authorial intent and then we move on from there. And I promise if you get that first part right, we can do the rest of this well. It's not, it's not always easy extracting a theological timeless principle. It's not always there, but it's easier if you have done well in that first, what did it mean then? Okay, guys, listen, uh, once again, thank you for showing up. Thank you all for uh, hanging out. Um, if you want to afterwards, I mean, maybe you guys got some questions or something. I don't know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish up right here. After I finish up, I'll stay on camera for a little while. I'll stay in this room. And if we have any questions, maybe we need to move it somewhere else sometime in the future. But for now, we'll just stay here. And I get an agglomeration of everybody's texts. 
uh, over here. So no matter where you're watching this at, whether it's uh, Facebook, whether it's YouTube, whether it's uh, X or Twitter, or X uh, now called, uh, all of those places, whether it's from Michael Patton or Credo House. Credo House is where you want to look at it for for it on YouTube. And by the way, those of you who are on Spotify, those of you who are listening to this later, you can watch this live. You can join us live. It's at 9 a.m. Cent- 9 a.m. Central, and you can go to YouTube, search for Credo House, and subscribe there, or you can go to Facebook, and you can either go to Credo House or Michael Patton. Uh, but I know it's somewhat confusing. Hopefully, we'll have all this kind of narrowed down, but thank you all for joining us. Please, if you if you enjoy what I'm doing, if you, if you believe in what I'm doing, if you want me to keep on being able to do this, please go to my Patreon, patreon.com forward slash C Michael Patton. I'll try to put it up here again uh, so that you can see it, patreon.com forward slash C Michael Patton and support. So uh, we'll see you next time.